Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show. Um, there is some debate out in the world, in the library world, about what these things are called or should be called, <laughs> what terminology there is for them. Um, but whatever we are, whatever you want to call us, we're here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. The show is free and open to anyone to watch, um, both our live show on Wednesdays and our recordings. So if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website, and I'll show you that at the end of the show, and view our archives of all of our shows that we've put up online. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos, um, author chats, uh, basically anything library related, um, we grab it and put it on and have it on the show. We're always looking for new ideas, too. Um, we have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, and sometimes we bring in guest speakers, as we have this morning. On the line with us from East Coast, New York, Pace University, um, is uh, Steve File and um, Phil, eh, Phil Pagali um, from Mortola Library at Pace University. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you? Did I say that all correctly? Um, Pronounce it all? Uh, yeah, I mostly. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got my right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, Steve and Phil, actually, for those of you who may not be um, work where I used to work. I worked at Pace University um, before I came here to Nebraska. That was a while ago. Um, <laughs> um, Steve actually um, officially replaced me in what my previous position was. Things have all changed since then there. But... Um, he came on board as my replacement. Um, and just on a personal note, he also happens to be my brother-in-law. So uh, I don't know <laughs> if that has anything to do with anything, but um, we are a library family, yeah. Um, me, my sister, Steve. So um, this uh, human library program, I've seen um, various libraries across the country doing it. It's it's a new thing going on, and I saw that um, my old place was doing it here at Mortola, and I thought it would be great to have them on and talk about how they pulled it off, the whole process, how it went. So um, I contacted Steve, and they said, yeah, we can come, sure. So um, I'll just hand it over to you guys. You can take it away and go through your presentation. If anybody has any questions throughout it, just ask as you feel. I can grab your questions here and um, uh, pass them on as they come through. Okay, ahead, I guess yeah. we're off. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep, yeah. um, <laughs> then I'll, I'm going to start sharing uh, some of the video just so you can sort of oh, see the men, yep. the men behind the men behind the <laughs> curtain here. Hi guys. Um, so we'll keep that on for our introductions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so first I want to say thank you for to the to Krista and the Nebraska Library Commission for having us come in. Um, you know, Krista, we're keeping it all in the family here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're excited to be able to come and talk a little bit about our human library program. Um, you know, we're hoping, you know, to have a conversation with everyone here to explain what we did with the Human Library Program, why we did it, maybe some some tips and and and, and information that for how you might be able to uh, to use it in your local library, whether it be academic or public, um, and also from a very real perspective. I mean, we are a very normal library. We had no experience with this whatsoever, so you know, we had to learn along the way. So hopefully that's something that's valuable to people that are maybe considering doing this or have not even heard about it, that it's really something that I think we found to be pretty valuable and that was actually a really cool thing, but you know, some stuff that we really learned from it. So so before I go too much further, again, my name is Steve File. I'm the Associate University Librarian at the Mortola Library at Pace University. Um, and this is my I'm Phil Pajali, I'm instructional services librarian uh, at Pace. Um, so I'm going to turn off the, the, the video to sort of save some bandwidth, but um, we'll come back again at the end when if there's any questions that people have or if there's questions that come up in, in, in during the during the presentation, um, you know, feel free, feel free to chime in through through Krista or audio or or, or whatever. Um, so let me I will close this out. So to give you a little context of where we were coming from. Um, at Pace University, we're a multi-campus uh, institution. Um, the main campus will, would be in our, in our lower Manhattan campus, so in New York City. Um, if for any of you that have been to New York, down by the Brooklyn Bridge, um, we have about 
6,000 students or so that are down on that campus. Um, and then Phil and I, we work in the um, Pleasantville campus, so we are a suburban campus, um, you know, half an hour by train from, from, from Manhattan. Um, so we are a, a suburban atmosphere here as opposed to New York City, which is a very urban environment. Um, we have about 3,000 students around on this campus. So that's kind of a little bit about the makeup of where we stand in terms of the physical world, you know, for, for, for that. Um, so we had our human library event on April 16th um, of this past semester, um, and we thought it was it turned out to be a very good event and uh, and very useful. And we'll give you some background information about um, how leading us up to to that event. So let's go. So first, for those of you who haven't heard of a human library event. Um, the Human Library um, was first started in, in, in Denmark in 2000, um, and here's a description from, from their website of what the Human Library um, is all about. There was also another quote that I don't have a slide for, but that I can read that, well, basically, in a nutshell, it gives your users, which in this case of this are called readers, um, access to personal stories, of, of people from your community or outside your community. Um, it's meant as a way to sort of break down barriers of, of prejudice, folks that maybe come from underrepresented populations, people that have gone through obstacles in their life that, you know, or just have compelling stories that are of interest to your local community. Um, so, you know, but the idea behind it was really, again, breaking down barriers. Um, you know, between groups of people or people on, on in your community, um, we had to register. I mean, we we did register our event with the Human Library Organization. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that, that you know it was official. Um, you know, they just want to also check to make sure, basically, for quality control purposes, that you know people aren't doing this with an agenda. Um, you know, that they're trying to push a point of view or, or anything like that, that, you know, so it was very simple to actually register and, and, and work with them. You know, we really, would, you know, they sent us some advice on, on, on how to go with, it, with an event. Um, other places call their events uh, living libraries. You can see that out there as well. Um, but we wanted to organize ourselves with the human library and make it part of like a bigger worldwide thing. And if you go to their site, you can, you can see that they do events, you know, or they have events all over the world, including the United States. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, when we were, you know, in, in explaining what a human library event is, um, it's not, a, it's not just about, you know, it's about breaking down the barriers of prejudices, but it's also about ways of sharing stories that you don't even, that you're not even aware of. I mean, there are people around us, you know, whether you work in a public library or an academic library that have fascinating stories to tell and interesting experiences, but sometimes you don't even know to ask them, you know, and this was a great way for us to sort of share those really personal and compelling stories that we knew anecdotally were all around us, um, but this is a really nice way of sort of really formally getting those stories and that information out to, to your local population, um, you know, and then we can talk, and we'll talk later on a little bit about some of the challenges of getting to the, to those stories. Um, so going into, into the event, why did we want to plan a human library event? I think one of the, you know, the strengths that we have at PACE is our diversity of our, our student body, of our, our campuses, of our students, faculty, staff, come from a range of, of backgrounds and experiences. And, and you know, whether it be from the urban location in our New York City campus or our suburban campus, you know, there's really a great diversity of, of people and stories that were there, um, you know, that we really wanted to tap into. So it's one of the great things that we have at Pace is, is that diversity. You know, one of the weaknesses that we have is that we tend to be somewhat of a fragmented uh, population, um, you know, very siloed in ways, um, you know, between whether it just be between our campuses or the identity of our campuses being urban and suburban. Um, you know, basically, you know, we have a difficult time identifying who we are, you know, as an institution, um, you know, and that sharing information across boundaries, whether, you know, it be 
between the academic schools or whether it be between the different library locations. So we really are kind of a fragmented in seeking really seeking an identity. Um, you know, and one of the reasons why we, you know, we planned this event was to sort of help get a better understanding of who we are as a community. Um, to share stories that we knew that were out there, whether we with, with our student population or our faculty staff uh, population as well. Um, we were just looking to internally for our stories, um, for our books. Um, we wanted to, again, we want this as a, as a community building event, and we, so we just look within our faculty, staff, and student population. We didn't go out to the local community around us um, here in Pleasantville, New York. We didn't go out looking for outside stories. We were really just looking at this as an internal, as an internal thing. Um, so we, you know, we were really looking as a, as, a, as a great way of sort of sharing that and building that community. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the reason why. I don't remember even how I heard about the Human Library. I was trying to, I was racking my brain. I had heard about it sometime in the last fall, I think, and maybe it was, I think, just reading about it, but it wasn't an aha moment, but something was an aha moment. You know, I think maybe it was just talking to people saying, oh, this would be a really great way of sharing stories and, and build community that I saw that was sort of lacking. We drew inspiration from, the, if, you, if you just do Google searches, there are many different places that have done human or living library um, events. These were three of the, of the places that we use as inspiration or some of the things that we use for inspiration um, that I think had a, were very good for introducing people to what the human library um, was about. And I think that's something as you go in, if you've never done this before, like we had never done this before, there's a whole lot of education of people, whether they be your, the readers that would be coming to your event, but just as importantly, the books that would be coming to the event. So these were actually three, three sources that we used when we sort of approached our books or sending out information sort of, you know, planning event, trying to get people to understand what this, this is the type of thing that we're trying to do and this is what it, the events can do. Um, there's a lot more that are out there, but these were just great overviews for us to be able to send out and I think would be useful uh, if you've never heard of the Living Library or Human Library to take a look at uh, because they really explain it well and I sort of you know put it into into context. Uh, I just want to jump in Steve and let everyone know um, all these links that are mentioned here we'll have in the show notes afterwards so don't have don't try and kill yourself trying to scribble down all these long URLs or anything um, we have them all I'm, I'm grabbing them and putting them into our delicious account and you'll have a whole link a link to all of them afterwards so you can get to everything that was mentioned. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And, and they, they, yeah, they were yeah, a lot longer than people can. But yeah, that, if you can take a look at them later, these are, again, great places that we drew inspiration from as we went into the sort of planning phase of, of our event. Um, I'll pass it off to Phil to talk a little bit about the gathering of the stories and what we were trying to do when we went into the, the, the sort of plan, the actual planning process. Yeah, on that previous page, you see the, the three links, but we actually looked at a lot of different um, uh, human or living library events uh, at academic as well as public libraries and I actually think this type of event is more common in public libraries at least uh, in the US but actually going back to what Stephen mentioned before about um, humanlibrary.org um, based in Denmark if you register with them they will send you materials that you can use uh, in the event ultimately we didn't use uh, any of them but uh, they will uh, send you some things like um, library card templates that you can use uh, and that kind of brand the event uh, and you can also use it in the advertising as well. So looking at um, some of those events um, on the other page, uh, ac academic and public libraries, um, we noticed that uh, the venues had uh, for their events a diverse mix of people um, who had experienced hardships and uh, overcome significant obstacles. Uh, people who were survivors of war uh, or disease, uh, people who thought of themselves as outsiders because of discrimination with race or gender uh, or disabilities, or just people who found themselves in challenging conditions overseas or in unfamiliar territory. Uh, and we hope that we could encourage interaction among people who may not normally uh, bring up these issues in conversation. So from this research, Steve and I were able to discuss the types of people we would like to see as part of this uh, human library. 
Uh, so this, these included people from the LGBTQ community, uh, military veterans, religious figures, survivors of cancer or other diseases, recent immigrants and refugees of war. Uh, we actually uh, we were interested in feedback from the students, so um, I created a poster uh, describing the event, and uh, and we went over to the campus student center and set up a table and had the poster out, and we actually had a, uh, like a survey form uh, that the students could complete, and on the survey it read of the choices listed below, which book types would interest you. Uh, and they were allowed to choose more than one, and we had listed veteran, LGBTQ, minority, uh, immigrant, Muslim. Uh, we actually had some wild cards in here, entrepreneur, inventor, um, uh, which actually we didn't end up getting anybody no. in that in that area, um, but also survivor uh, and other. We also had a suggestion box at the end of the sheet because uh, we were interested in seeing the students had you know, would suggest any anyone that, uh, or any type that was unusual or outside what we were thinking. Um, we got we got some uh, comments based on that, um, but actually, the majority of the people that we ended up getting were um, either recommended by our colleagues, um, particularly the faculty members, or they were people that we um, sent emails to. And asked about we had heard that they had interesting stories or interesting backgrounds, and we contacted them through email or just uh, approached directly uh, in person. Okay, um, so actually, one colleague recommended a Pace professor at the New York City campus, who neither Steve nor I had even heard of, um, an African American and former police chief. Uh, so he ended up joining the event, and he became one of our most uh, requested and popular books. Uh, since many of the personal stories that we were seeking um, are of a very delicate nature, uh, we decided a good way to ask certain students, um, as opposed to the faculty, to be books um, would be through the student organizations um, or through the offices that were assisting students. Um, so we we attempted to reach out by contacting, uh, for example, Muslim Student Association. Uh, the organization of Latin American students, but also the offices of multicultural affairs uh, and disability services. Unfortunately, actually, we, we didn't get much of a response. Um, some of the student organizations were inactive, uh, or uh, the leaders or the representatives were occupied with other commitments, because this was pretty late in the semester, so mm -hmm. people were tied up with projects um, or you know, other responsibilities. Uh, so again, we, we ended up getting the majority of our books uh, through email or approaching them directly um, or from uh, our colleagues recommending people. So we ended up with um, eight individuals for the event uh, who agreed to participate as books, six faculty and two students. Um, we actually had three, originally we had three additional students, but they ended up dropping out because again it was late in the semester so they had um, they had to complete projects or they were tied up with the exams. So the eight individuals we had were um, the African American former assistant chief of the NYPD, who I mentioned earlier, um, an African American uh, lesbian eight year Navy veteran and nursing student, was number two. Uh, number three, um, our campus chaplain, a uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic sister who had uh, worked as a psychiatric social worker. Number four, a cancer survivor who had worked with orphans, prisoners, refugees uh, in Kenya and Latin America. Number five, the daughter of Jewish Lithuanians who had survived the Holocaust by working in the slave labor camp. Number six, a female pastor who had earned a certificate in theology and ministry uh, and had taken an online class in technology that had led her to become a computer programmer. Number seven, a Navy veteran and immigrant nursing student. And number eight, um, actually one of the ESL instructors who had taught English in Japan and struggled in his first year because of the language barrier. He wanted to talk about that. So those were our eight individuals. And you'll see later that we had included um, the character descriptions in our advertising. And I, we have a photo of the, of the poster that we put up for the, uh, at the event. Um, giving the 
descriptions of each person. Okay. So when you know going into considerations for as you plan a human library event, I mean some of the things that you you know that we had to tackle. Um, that you would, if you were thinking about doing a similar event, these are some of the things that you would have to try and figure, you know, plan on or, or make decisions about. Um, you know, what kind of a size of event are you really looking for? I mean, we were, we knew we were looking for a smaller type event. In our research, we had seen, you know, events that had, you know, that lasted multiple days, that had, you know, over 30 different books. That, you know, we would, we knew that we were looking, I think, ideally, you know, for 10 to 12 books. I mean, we ended up with with eight in the end. So, but we were looking for a smallish type event. So, you know, what kind of event? You know, what kind of size? What? How many different? Even, you know, if you're if you're a small or individual that's planning an event like this, how many, how many stories are you or you know, possible stories are you aware of just on your own? Um, you know, to sort of see how many people can you th you think you'd be able to draw into something like this? Um, you know, one of the things that we also had in terms of deciding on a smaller event was one of the main concerns that we you know had going in was turnout for the event um, you know one of the the problems or uh, you know challenge that we have here at pace is that there's a lot of events that go on on campus that are really good and, and really engaging but the turnout are, are, can, can be disappointing so we were worried that we would do this a lot of you know this great event and get all these wonderful books to have people check out but that there wouldn't be anybody there to check them out um, you know so that was also part of our concern of maybe you know starting on a smaller scale um, you know so that it wouldn't be you know if we didn't get the turnout that it wouldn't be embarrassing for us or for, or for the books although you know our, all of our books coming from within the community of uh, at pace know that this is a challenge of, of having turnout for events so they were all aware that you know sometimes you know you're gonna have a great event but not a lot of people are gonna show up so they were kind of aware of that so we had sort of prepped our books on, on that um, you know, what kind of a location are, do you have available? Um, you know, the, in one of the next slides will show a photo of the area that we use. But, you know, we wanted an area, again, that was visible but not so visible that it was, you know, people might be sort of gawking kind of thing, but someplace that people might pass by, be interested in checking out a book, but at the same time private enough that people could have, you know, meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversations. I mean, and the purpose of a lot of the human libraries is really to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, or one-on-two. Um, so we have individual conversations with people. So we had an area that we could sort of break off that was that was an area that we could, for the day, that we could reserve that was visible. We could get a lot of walk-by traffic that we ended up, uh, and it was appropriate for a group of, you know, if we had 10 to 12 books that we were aiming for. Um, you also want it not so private because you need people still to monitor the event, so sort of walk around to make sure that the conversations aren't going bad or the things are you know pe people are, are, are keeping to your your time constraints that you've put on the event um, you know we also looked at having you know different areas and again this is also part of the fun of the event is how you can play it up to be like a library um, so you know the area where people had the conversations we called the reading room um, in some of the research we had done they also suggested having maybe a separate little area called the bookshelf where books could go either where they wanted it a few moments away or that they could relax or you know while they were not being checked out so that was the bookshelf area um, you know then you've got the checkout desk again that's where the people would be approached to go in and, and check out one of the books that you had available and then you've got librarians quote librarians to monitor the area which don't have to be librarians those are just people that are making sure that everything is going smoothly and again that the conversations are, 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 are going okay and again we were looking for some place that was going to be very comfortable for our, for people to sit back and sort of talk so yeah finding a place that you can just have that is good to talk um, you know finding an appropriate time or date of the event for us we were you know is it spring or fall semester we went with spring because so much goes on in the fall you know, one piece of advice is don't underestimate the amount of time it takes to plan an event like this, especially for the first go around. So we, I'm very glad that we ended up doing it for the spring, just because it gave us basically the whole fall to talk about this and, and sort of drum up interest and, and get it going. Whereas if you do it in a fall semester, for those academic libraries that are out there, you know, you come back and it's just you, you're you're going, and by the time you'd be able to get the event going, it would be towards the end of the semester, and you know. You, Again, that was some one of the obstacles we had was we maybe waited too long in the spring semester when things got a little bit too busy for our students. Um, 
so we were looking for a time of day, you know, that again, what's a busy day in your library? So for us, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays are incredibly busy here. And we decided not to go with that because it's hard to sort of partition off that space. Thursdays was our, our sort of our compromise of it's busy, but not so crazy busy that we couldn't like say, you know, reserve the space that we wanted to use for the event. Um, so we ended up going with a Thursday afternoon. You know, what's the length of your event? You know, we thought that it would three hours was an appropriate amount of time to sort of expect people to dedicate towards being a book for this event. And even with the three hours, we had people that couldn't stay for the full three hours and, you know, that were either had to leave early or arrived late to make themselves available as a book. So, but we found that the three hour actually was a, was a pretty good time limit, you know, because we found that after, after the event, it is kind of, you know, especially if it was busy and like it was, it, it, three hours is a lot to talk constantly. Um, you know, we had very little downtime for a lot of our books. And so three hours, you know, is a good time to start, I think. If we were to go more than that, I think it would be we try and segment it into maybe a morning session and afternoon, have different books in the morning and different books in the afternoon. Because three hours is, is a really, I think, a good time to expect um, and from, from, from folks. Um, PR materials, that's, I think, the key thing of how do you get the word out about um, your event. Um, I think the most important thing, whether you're gathering books, is to talk, you know, keep talking to people. So there's the people that you know that have good stories, but the importance of getting out, you know, if you have a meeting or for me, you know, going to faculty council, talk to people at faculty council. If I'm going to a curriculum committee, I talk to people at the curriculum committee about it. Like that's the way, I think the most important way of doing the PR for the event is to talk about it. Um, we did the normal things. We did teaser posters around campus. Um, I'm actually going to go into that so you can take a look at that. The teaser poster is the, the poster there on the left. It did not include book descriptions. It was just meant as this is what a human library event is and this is when we're having it. So it did not have any of our book descriptions. So you can go with that approach or you can have the book descriptions, but also note that it takes time to get the book descriptions from people too. So we were kind of glad that we didn't put, have to wait for all of our book descriptions to come in uh, to, do, to do that. So we put teaser posters around campus. We used local LCD signs within the library. We used it's the student development campus activities, have something called a flush flash, which is where they, uh, they well, initially, originally it was advertising in the bathroom, but now it's gone away from just being in the bathrooms. Um, again, talking to people. Um, we, we put it in the weekly university email. Uh, we use the university LCD signs that we have around campus. Um, on the day of the event, we actually use an old beam projector that we have and we beamed uh, an image onto the floor of the library, which, by the way, is if you have an old beam projector in your library, is a great way of using it if you're not using it anymore. Um, it looks, makes it look like a museum kind of exhibit. So we beamed it onto the floor. It got some notice there. And I think also the you know, personal invites. You know, as we got close to the event, personally inviting people that we knew around campus to come out to be, book, or to be, reader, to be readers at the event. Food and beverage is always a good thing. We had coffee, tea, some cookies, um, so it was very light. But again, things that would sort of help with conversation. Um, you know, and then what kind of book content? What kind of you know, knowing your community, whether it be a public library or an academic library, what stories are of interest to your community? What barriers are you trying to break down? Um, what stories might you be able to get from 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 uh, from those areas? And finally, it's also talking about a checkout process. You know, what is the process that you um, want to have for, for checking out the books that you have available um, and setting up those parameters? Um, I'm not sure. The important thing also, you know, in, in, in setting up those parameters is, is you need to spend time preparing your books for the event. And again, especially if you've never done this before. Um, oh, by the way, this is the space that we ended up using for it. So we took all the comfortable chairs that we could have, that we found in the library, and we moved them all to the first floor. So those, we put it into this area that we use as the common area. That was the reading, the reading room of our, for our event. In terms of preparing your books, I mean, I think the important thing about that is most of your books have never done this before and never heard of a human library. So, you know, you need to really prep them. Again, those sites that we shared earlier, 
um, you know, one of the first things you need from them after you've gotten a commitment from them is obtaining a, a book description from them. Um, so we, you know, I think it was three, four weeks before the event, we're asking them for a title of their book, so something catchy that would just sort of describe them as a book, and then three to five sentences describing their book, sort of giving them the clues, like in your book description, you should include all the aspects of your life that you think you'd be willing to share. So because people are going to be looking at that description and say, okay, this is basically how the the, the conversation will be beginning is talking about some of the things in their description. So, you know, three to five sentences, they could be cr super creative and they want to be creative or it could be just as straightforward, um, you know, as you, as, as they want it to be as well. You know, some were more creative than others. Others, you know, were very much, you know, straightforward about who they are and what they wanted, you know, to include in their descriptions. Um, you know, we also asked them, you know, to prepare maybe five questions that they would go in um, into their heads about what questions they might ask themselves uh, that would help gen you know, generate conversation. Because some of our students might be a little bit um, you know, timid in terms of starting a conversation. Um, so we wanted to, you know, so that they would be prepared with some questions that they would ask themselves that they might be able to throw out to, um, you know, to them. Um, you know, other things that we said was also to keep in mind to maybe ask this, the readers questions as well. So it's not just about them, but asking questions. So some of the questions we suggested were ask for the reader, the book to ask the reader, why did you choose me as a human book? Or have you ever met someone like me before? Or um, did you have a good or a bad experience with a person like me? So it's not just about their stories, but also about the readers themselves. So we tried to sort of prompt them to sort of go in with, with, with that in mind. Um, you know, when we set the parameters, it's, you know, for the day we were looking, you know, how long do you want your books to be able to be checked out for? We ended up choosing 30 minutes, so 30, 30 minute slots. We also prepped the books to be able to let people know that 30 minutes is your maximum time, that to be completely okay with if someone wants to have a conversation for five minutes that's completely cool it does not mean you have to check out and we try to get this to the readers as well that it's okay if you want to have a short conversation because sometimes those can be just as meaningful as a 30 minute conversation so you know we really said you know five minutes is fine and the, for the books that it's not an insult it's okay if someone just wants to talk and maybe just want to ask you one question and then that was the end of the conversation and for the most part people did stay towards the longer of the 30 minute time slot but we wanted to prep our books and our readers that shorter conversations were welcome you know just as well um, the other parameters that we had um, you know that we sort of set for the readers and that we made the books aware of were that the book and the reader and the subjects discussed will be treated with mutual respect the readers and the books may opt out of a conversation at any time for any reason so a reader or a book could opt out at any moment, and that's kind of why you have people that are sort of floating around um, to make sure conversations are going okay. That the reader will return the book in the same mental and physical condition in which it was borrowed. So basically, that you're you know you're not going in to to harm in any way mentally the 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 book in in terms of your your line of questioning. And also that you the reader would keep an open mind to viewpoints and perspectives different from their own. So we set those up at the checkout desk um, so that people were aware of before they would check out a book that these were what our expectations were for the readers. And we made aware that the, the, the books were also aware of these as well. Um, we also told them, you know, in prepping the books, that they could also bring any photos or artifacts that they wanted um, to the event um, that might help explain their stories. So a few of them did take us up on that, but if they had photo albums or you know something from that just helps describe who they are or their story, we encourage them to bring them as well. So now I will pass it off back to Phil to talk about the actual day of the event. Okay, yeah, so it was on uh, April 16, 2015, and you'll see um, the space again from the, the earlier photo, but this is actually when the event was going on. Now, this was actually, um, this was held in a section of the library on the first floor toward the entrance that's, um, that's normally used for uh, group study, and it's a very popular section of the library. 
Um, a lot of the students will use the computers in the area. Um, we needed to close that that space off for about three hours. Um, and actually, we had booked uh, a room to the right. It's not in the photo. To, to the uh, to the right, just out of the frame of the photo, uh, there was a room for the books to to have to to talk and just kind of rest uh, and have a little bit of downtime. Um, but there's a challenge when you're closing off a section of this library, and that's um, how to how to basically keep it exclusive to to the event. Uh, to give privacy to the people who are participating, um, to essentially keep the normal student traffic out, but also um, to encourage students to come in. Okay, so when we put up these barriers, we had, you'll see the white, whiteboard in the photo, uh, a couple of whiteboards, uh, telling them that there was an event going on and when and that it would be closed off for three hours, but also giving information about the event. So hopefully we can encourage walk-ins, just students just coming by who would see what was going on in the space and think, hey, this looks kind of interesting. What, what is this all about? Uh, so we also um, put up, uh, these, are, these are actually the books. Uh, so this is shortly after they arrived mm -hmm. before we, we had opened it officially, and they're talking and getting to know each other. Um, but we put up a poster with all of the book descriptions. Okay, and we had it, um, each of them numbered uh, right by uh, the entrance along with the uh, registration table. Um, you can't see the actual descriptions too clearly, but we, you see we had some, uh, hopefully some eye-catching uh, human book uh, names. So you'll see, uh, just let me explain. Just let me explain from programmer to professor to preacher. Uh, so the process was um, a student uh, or a faculty member, whoever wanted to be involved, would approach the poster, um, read the description, and, uh, and then uh, get the number and approach the uh, registration desk and say, I would like to check out four or five. Uh, and uh, once that happened, uh, I, I was at the table, I was manning the table along with uh, Steve was there uh, most of the time. Uh, so the person would give the number of the book they were interested in, and then I would have corresponding numbered cards uh, for each book, okay? And then I would um, write down the expiration time on the card, so each, each book would have, uh, or each reader would have 30 minutes to talk to the book. Uh, so I would write down, you know, if it was at 2.30, you have, to, you have until 3 o'clock, and uh, hand the card to the person, and then tell them to hold on to it and return it uh, after they were done, so we would know, you know, what books were, were now available. Uh, I also kept um, a sign-in sheet, so I kept my own record of what books had been checked out and when they would be due back. Um, this got actually a little, as we got more and more people, uh, later in the day, this got to be a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit crazy uh, because some of the readers weren't weren't returning the cards, um, and uh, sometimes I had so many people at the table, I was getting a little confused myself. Uh, so one thing that we would do differently is we would have more people uh, staff at the table. Um, also, when they when they came back and hopefully returned their uh, checkout cards, we would give them a feedback form. Um, asking them if they were satisfied with the event um, and whether they had, you know, additional comments. Okay, that was really about it. They were very small feedback forms. Okay, so now if somebody approached and uh, that the particular book or number was already taken, um, I had, uh, hopefully I had the record of the book's uh, due date time so I could tell the person, this book, this person is um, checked out, or this book is checked out until 3 o'clock. Uh, if you come back at three o'clock, uh, you know you can you can have some time with that person. And we did keep a waiting list, although that didn't that didn't get too that didn't get too crazy. So ultimately, we had um, we had about 34 checkouts total. And we, again, the event was three hours. Um, the readers were allowed 30 minutes with each book, and we had about a 10 minute break uh, halfway through the event. 
we had we had somebody from the school newspaper show up, and he ended up checking out a lot of books and writing a nice article about the event and giving you know giving the event some more exposure. So hopefully, some people read that and uh, will be interested in the event the next time we do it. Um, one thing that uh, I think we could do. Um, a little differently next time, so we could be a little bit more proactive about getting walk-ins. Um, and I, I think actually Steve and I are a little bit shy, mm -hmm. so we were maybe a little bit uh, uh, reluctant to to pitch to, to you know pitch it to the students walking by. Um, and all, but also it was again, uh, you know, I've said this a few times, but it was later in the semester, so I uh, there were students uh, in in the library who were working on projects, group projects, uh, and they were cramming for exams. And they told us, there were a few that told us, you know, normally I would come in uh, and talk to a few of the folks, but uh, it's just as a right time in the semester, so I have to get I have to get this work completed. So I think if actually we had the event just a little bit earlier in the semester, maybe in March, okay, before it gets um, really crazy with the exams, we would get we would have gotten more of a turnout. Okay. Um, the yeah, so there I am at the table. Um, actually, the there's a student worker on the left who's um, uh, with the, the paste, the blue paste T-shirt, and she was she managed to get a few of the people. Mm -hmm. Like she's very extroverted, and she was able to get people interested. But she normally works at the technical help desk, so she helps people uh, borrow laptops, uh, etc. So. Um, Feedback or, or reaction to the event? Oh, th this is this is actually a photo of um, all the books. Uh, it looks like everybody there is talking to. Everybody has a reader. There are two of the books standing up in the back having a conversation. Uh, but uh, this was basically uh, this is what it looked like when it was going on, uh, probably about halfway through the event. So a reaction to the event, um, again, we had uh, 34 total checkouts, mostly staff and faculty, not a lot of students. Um, lessons learned, we would allow more break time for the books. Um, I think some of our books, uh, they became exhausted because they, they have three people in a row that they had to talk to. So that would be, that would be about an hour and a half. Um, and they were, they were, Exhausted not just from the conversation, but also the subject matter, because a lot of them had very emotional uh, things that they were talking about. And Steve and I had talked about, well, we would next time we'll we'll bring in more Kleenex because yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. there was there was a lot of crying going on. So this is a very uh, this is emotionally trying for them. Um, so we would allow for more break time. Uh, we had great feedback both from uh, the books and the readers. Um, I think. A lot of the readers, we had to we had to go back and tell them, you know, your time is up. They would actually go over the time, uh, 35, 40 minutes. So, uh, and there would be somebody waiting. Um, the books, the participants. Um, uh, there was at least there were a few people who told us that uh, the readers uh, that they were that they had spoken to were interesting and interesting stories. So it seemed to be about. In some cases, it was an, uh, an equal. Uh, give and take in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the conversation, uh, but they they said you know this was wonderful. Um, we're gonna we're gonna tell people about this. We're gonna talk to our colleagues and and try to get them involved uh, the next time uh, that we do this. Um, and you know again we're we we we're gonna have to think of ways to um, to engage the students more. Uh, as books and readers, um, through whether that's through the advertising, uh, whether that's through just approaching them uh, during the actual event uh, and getting more walk-ins, and again uh, moving moving the uh, the day of the event to perhaps earlier uh, in the semester. I mean, I think you know, and, and from my side, I'm, I'll, I'll turn the camera back on for sort of this as we sort of finish things off here. So, you know. One of the things that I was sort of was really happy with the 34, by the way, is, is a really good number for this event. So, you know, in, in terms of putting it in context, pretty much all our books were checked out for most of them almost all the time. So, 34 is actually a really good number. Um, you know, and then one of the things that was really sort of energized me after the event was the the, the the enthusiasm from the books was really like palatable. 
like you had some of the you know the books came with like this was so much this is awesome you know and and for our own benefit one of the books had uh, right after uh, after our event was going for uh, uh, a meeting with the provost and was just gushing to the provost and I got an email afterwards from the provost sort of you know you know, saying how much he appreciated that we're trying, you know, these these types of creative ways of, of, of creating community, and it was all because one of our books went and was, was like so enthusiastic about the event, and from the from the book side of things, and you know, um, and I think that's one of the things that you'll learn. You know, I think we're learning is that I think we're hoping for the next time we do this, you have to start. You know, if you start small, it's the word of mouth. So all of these books that we had for this event are super enthusiastic and. It's about increasing your sphere of okay. We know our own stories with people that we interact with regularly. Um, we know their stories, but then your books know other people with other stories or other you know aspects of their life that would be interesting to share. And you sort of okay, you need to build that out so you can make a bigger event or have more books or you know get different you know different books you know. And I think it also way of it's a way of engaging people too because we had a problem of. You know, for, for the most part, Phil and I did this event just us. Um, you know, we tried to engage some other folks to become part of a committee, but no one wants to join a committee um, to help us make decisions and plan this event. Or, you know, we weren't really faced with a decision of having people say that I'm interested in being a book, and then having to tell them no. So I think having a larger group of people that would help make decisions if as the event gets bigger, we might be faced with situations of people saying they're interested in telling their story but we if it doesn't resonate or doesn't you know, with your community being able to tell them no and it's a lot easier to do that as a committee than it is me as you know associate university librarian saying no I'm not interested in having your story told um, so I think engaging people on that committee level too beyond just being books or, or readers and I really think people will come out I mean having recognition of the event I think people will come out even more the next time we do it, um, and I hope we can, you know, make it to a larger event. I mean, I think, like you said, as Phil said, we really need to find a way to engage our students better. You know, the student organizations didn't quite work out so well. You know, of getting, we know there are stories there that I think, you know, I think it takes a certain type of student. You know, I think it would to be able to want to tell their story, particularly if it's a very emotional story. You know, I, I envision that it would mostly would be juniors or seniors that are again more comfortable with who they are and who or who they become in college, telling their story and being able to pass that off to other students or other colleagues. Um, you know, but how do we get those stories and get those students to you know to see be, to participate and be read both readers and books? I mean, but even more so on the book side of things. Um, you know, we were really disappointed that we had those two or three students that ended up dropping out, and I think doing it earlier in their semester will, will definitely help with that. Um, so that is kind of the end of our um, the presentation part of things. Um, you know, do people have any? Do people have any, Do people have any questions? Okay. Um... I don't know yet. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Stephen Phil. That was that was great. That's exactly what I was hoping. It looks like you guys seem to take everything you could think of into consideration with this, um, with planning it and running it and everything. But like you said, seeing other places that had done it, um, that helps. Now, um, if uh, well, well, actually, let me say one more thing. I, I forgot one thing I was going to say. One one opportunity for us to advance in terms of next time, and this is again for both your public and academic libraries is. Maybe not the next time, but maybe the beyond that, I'd love to be able to do a partnership with our local public library. Mm. I think that would be awesome. Like be able to have almost like a two-day event where we could have representatives from our campus community plus representatives from the local community come in so and have one day here in our library mm -hmm. and then in the next day have it in the public library because that's also about how do you generate like for those but for those of you that are in, um, you know, communities where public and active, how do you create that, okay, the local community understanding who you are and what is the local community about? Like, I'd love to eventually get into that mm -hmm. with a local public library. So I think great academic public library cooperation. There. Definitely, yeah. That was going to be one of my questions. Thanks a lot. Um, was <laughs> Well, actually, you even expanded more. I was just going to ask if you were ever thinking about bringing in, and because you said you limited this for the first time out just to PACE people to be the books, if you were ever thinking about bringing in from outside of, to to come in from, from the local community but um, 
what you suggested even better right. yeah go out there and have yeah. them come in and, and do it both together yeah i do think that is sometimes <sighs> public libraries and schools like k-12 seem to do more together academics or the universities and colleges for some reason sometimes just don't see that get that connection as well or have trouble with it i i guess um with you know saying we can do things together we can you know we're not just off here on our own and not not related i mean people are going to come to the public library if the university is not open when they need to do something for their school work right. or whatever and so they're going to have to have some sort of connection there um, so if anybody does have any questions, nothing came in while you were talking. Um, I was writing some things down um, as you were talking, though. But if anyone has any questions, type them into your question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, I can grab them from there. Or if you have a microphone, let me know, and I can unmute you. Um, I was wondering um, if you were considering, you did say going to two days, but were you thinking of doing a longer Three hours to me seemed, well, without knowing how it was going to go, three hours seemed kind of short with that many books to talk to. But was that something you would do longer than three hours of a, of a block? Or would that also be just so ugh, huge? I don't know. I mean, did you think it was kind of you needed more time as far as the block of time as well? I think we could go up to four hours. But at a certain point, your books are so exhausted from sure. talking. Yeah. You know, and you know, I think the better way of doing it would I would either be to increase the number of books available, or increase the checkout period. You can thirty minutes is kind of a long conversation, so you could go down to fifteen to twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so you could shorten that, so you could get more checkouts. Or like I said I think you could do it also in terms of having different books in the morning and and different books in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Or you know, from ten till one, this slate of books is available, and then from one to four this slate of books is available. I mean, I think it just, even with our faculty, to ask them to give a whole day is a lot to ask because there are, you know, they're gonna, even if you were going to do it all day long, they would most likely not be able to stay all day long. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, people have to other things they need to do, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, you did mention that you um, did, oh, you want to say something? Go oh, ahead. yeah. No, I was actually going to say that we, we, never, we never had all eight books there at the same time. We, we had two who could only be there for a limited amount of time. So we had like number seven was available there for the first hour and then number eight for the last hour. So we did kind of do that already where we had them at separate times. So anyway, I'm sorry, go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Um, we do have a comment. Um, a librarian from our one of our community colleges here in Nebraska, Southeast Community College, says um, they'd seen an art. I've seen an article about the Human Library and shared it with our global education coordinator. Um, I believe we'll be planning an event like this in the near future. I'll be sharing this re recording with the coordinator because he was unable to join me today. So that's great. Our locals. I know one of our. I believe University of Nebraska Omaha has done this as well. Trying to remember off the top of my head, <laughs> um, but this is a community college. I should probably be involved in it. And that would be good. yeah, it's great. I mean, there's I mean, there's ways of even honestly doing it online. I mean, if you wanted to, you know, how do you share stories, you know, via the web? I mean, something like this would work out just mm -hmm. perfectly. Is you know, checking out, you know, online. So I mean, I haven't read about anyone doing that. Yeah, but I'm sure that, it's, you know, it's it's really possible for for remote people or making it bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you did talk about that you had some rules about um, how people could ask, what people could ask, and when people could walk away when it was getting too difficult or whatever. And you had some, I guess, people walking around checking out. So you didn't. That was one thing I was wondering about. As I was thinking about, you said that part of the reason is to bring out the stories that are delicate or that you might not really think about before. And you said there's a lot of emotional <laughs> responses from everybody, both books and readers. Did you have any? bad reactions as in negative from like either side or say or people coming in just trying to be you know or was it all pretty much come out because that's something I think some people may be concerned about is what if we have someone who comes in and talks about a really horrible situation or something that was really stressful and the person reading is not empathetic enough or whatever you know people pretty much I mean, we didn't have I mean we didn't we didn't have anything like that mm -hmm. and we were you know and you know, I think you know, it, but we could certainly see how it how it could happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's just a matter of again prepping your books so that they know that they can opt out and being aware. Um, you know, but also understand that it's okay to have challenging conversations too. Mm -hmm. Like that's you know, it's not you know, it's, it's it's basically it's okay to have different. Like you don't have to be, you don't have to 
be the same as that book, but mm -hmm. you have to be willing to accept their point of view and the same and vice versa. That so it's not meant as a way of you know, it's, it, you can have challenging conversations and that's okay and that's part of what this is all about too is that you can, talking to someone who you might not want to talk to or haven't talked to before, mm -hmm. you know, and sitting down and, you know, even if it's for a couple of minutes. So, like I said, we didn't, we didn't have that but I could certainly see it's, 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 it's a consideration and that's why setting that little, those ground rules mm -hmm. for before books were checked out it's kind of important, you know, to, to let people know that that's what's expected. Of yeah, them. having those set expectations ahead of time and making sure they understand this is how it's going to work. And if you don't, you're out of here. Yeah, that's very understandable. And I think exactly. that's part of what you're talking about is part of what should be part of going, at least in the academic situation, going to college is about challenging yourself and looking at these new things and learning new things that you might not have thought of before. And this totally fits all in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it doesn't look like anybody had any other questions. If any last minute things you want to get in here, hurry up. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, now you did say you have been making some uh, comments here and there about doing it in the future. So you're, you're going to do it again. Okay. Yes, I think okay. so. Yeah. I think we'll do it again in the next, most likely again next spring, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit larger of event. Um, I'm thinking, you know, um, earlier in the semester. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, and you know, other things just as a side, you know, I can see how this definitely is more popular coming from a background in the New York Public Library myself, knowing the fast. I used to work in the Bronx, you know, at a local public library, and, and Phil actually works at a public library now too, part time. You know, it's fast. You know, they're, they're fascinating people that come to public libraries, oh. and there are just as fascinating people that come to academic libraries. But I think it's just harder to get to those stories. I think from my experience in the public library, there's a whole lot of people that just want to tell their story. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. <You> know? <laughs> They're looking for somebody so, to listen, listen, yes. Exactly. And to, but to use that as an advantage, I mean, that's a, I mean, and, and you know, sometimes you may be annoyed, like, you know, oh, I just don't want to hear the person talking, but it's, you know, using that as an advantage. I mean, it's, it is a great thing about your community if, if you have these fascinating people that have compelling stories or stories of challenges or overcoming obstacles. It's a little bit more difficult in an academic library to sort of get to those stories, I think. You know, people aren't quite as willing to share. But that's kind of what the purpose behind it was it's to share that. Like get to, you know, this you know, computer science faculty member that you work with for years is also a pastor in a church. Yeah. And it, it <laughs> you know, never came awesome. up in the conversation about what does the computer science people need in the library. <laughs> it's you it wouldn't. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's great that you, you said that it's already getting word of mouth to them telling other people you need to participate in this as a book, you need to, you know, and finding other people for you. Um, it sounds like you might be one of the, you know, the cliche, the victim of your own success here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hopefully you don't get overwhelmed by it next time around. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anything else came in. Like I said, you guys were very uh, comprehensive with everything you talked about. I think that's great. I think this is going to be a great um, recording for people who are thinking about doing this um, and getting involved themselves. Um, like I said, I've seen that there's been these going on. I didn't know there was that group, that humanlibrary.org, that it was actually mm -hmm. uh, someone – I mean, I assume somebody started it up, um, but I didn't know there was like a place to register and do that kind of thing and get some real good support um, if you're uh, getting involved in that. Um, but actually, that, that reminds me of a question. Did you actually – I know you said you looked at lots of places done it. Did you actually contact any other libraries who'd done it, or you just looked at what they had out there about it? Like talk to anybody at another place who'd done it? Nah. There's yeah, a lot of information out there already, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it would, I mean, that certainly, you know, would have been helpful, you know, to have that. But we didn't really know anyone locally that had yeah. done it, you know, or people that, you know, yeah. whether, you know, part of our, I mean, I would have most likely in part of our library consortium, you know, mm -hmm. you know with, with Waldo or whatever to ask if someone had done it, but yeah. no one really had done it. So it was like, so we just, we just sort of based a lot of it on, you know, what was available. Right. You know, well, so, yeah, it sounds like you did good. Definitely being a, well. We're librarians. We're organized, generally speaking, so I think we can figure these things out. Yeah. <laughs> What's the worst things that can happen? Let's prepare for those. <laughs> All right. So I think that'll wrap up for today. We're a little after 11 a.m. Central Time, but we started a little after as well. So thank you very much, Stephen, Phil. That was great. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm yes. going to pull back presenter control to my screen now. Do, 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 do. There we go. Get rid of this. Where are we? There we are. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live. As I said, um, we um, 
have been recording. So the recording will be available potentially later today, depends on how long it takes to process and go through everything. Um, our archives go right here. This is our Encompass Live website. Um, you can just Google Encompass Live, we come up first. Um, our archives are over here, so it will be loaded up here uh, with the, this one just says recording and links, but um, uh, if you guys will, um, Steve, if you guys don't mind, if you email me or send me the slides or linked wherever you guys post them, I will um, sure. add those as well to here, I think here, yeah. Here when we had Courtney on uh, recording, our slide uh, goes on to YouTube, record uh, presentation, goes on SlideShare, and then our links go into our delicious account over here where I've started collecting them. So you'll have, like, as I said, all the links to all these sessions, all, everything that was mentioned during the show. I only posted there on our website. Um, if you So that will wrap it up for this week's show. Um, help you join us next week when our topic will be making the most of the cloud. I um, have another remote speaker, Robin Hastings, who's down at Northeast Kansas Library System, um, just south of us, is going to talk about cloud services and how you can use those in your library. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely um, sign up for that show or any of our other shows we have coming up. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, please do go ahead and like us over there. There it comes up. <laughs> and um, I do post reminders of what sessions are coming up. Here I posted this morning, reminder to log in right now on the fly for people. When the recording is available, I will post that as well onto here. So you'll know that um, the recording is ready to watch. So if you are big on Facebook, definitely do like us over there. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.